Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another of Chagas's Research Insights Seminar series. Today's uh, seminar is entitled Balancing the Demands from Land, and it will be about uh, looking at some of the research that Chagas uh, economists are doing uh, related to the issue of land use. Um, this series that this is the last of has been looking at agricultural sustainability, and at the heart of that is, of course, um, the broad research areas that Chagas is involved in that relate to agricultural land use. We've seen seminars and presentations from colleagues across the rural economy and the crops, environment and land use programmes that have looked at the economic drivers of land use choices by farmers and the environmental impacts of those land choices uh, across different environmental dimensions. And at the last seminar, we had a really interesting series of, of presentations on how we use remote sensing technologies and artificial intelligence to, to measure in a more efficient fashion um, what's happening in terms of, of our agricultural land use. Today, uh, we kind of re return to the, uh, to the kind of economic uh, perspective on, on land use. And we have a series of presentations that um, look at how economists using microeconomic data are thinking about the environmental consequences and the economic consequences of our land use decisions. Um, so I hope you enjoyed the, 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 the presentations. I'd encourage everybody who's out there in Zoom land to use the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom page if you have any questions about the presentations uh, as, they be, as they're being given or about the issues that are raised in general. And at the end of the seminar, we will have uh, lots of time to, uh, to answer those questions, hopefully. Um, and I hope you enjoy the seminar. The first presenter is my colleague from the Agriculture Economics and Farm Surveys Department, uh, Dr. Carl Buckley. Carl is an environmental economist with the Agriculture Economics and Farm Surveys Department. So I'm going to let Carl uh, take over and introduce his presentation. And uh, I hope I wish everybody a, a good seminar. And I'll leave it at that for the moment. Thanks, Kevin. You see my screen? Yeah. Okay, uh, good morning everyone. And uh, my presentation, essentially I'm gonna look at sustainability and the whole area of public good provision from, ag from agriculture and, and look a little bit about the, the alternative, look at the many demands we have we place on our agricultural land. So starting with an overview of the presentation, I'm gonna start with the, you know, outlining some of the current agricultural land uses and farm structures then speak a little bit about the economic and environmental services provided by land. Uh, talk then about the uh, public goods that, and services that we derive from agriculture. And I'm gonna finish then with a, a survey of, of farmer attitudes to public good provision in the next round of the, camera, of the common agricultural policy. So starting with the uh, agriculture in Ireland, there's about 6.9 million hectares total in Ireland. Uh, just over 4.5 is in agriculture, uh, just under 0 0.8 in forestry. Of the area in agriculture, 92% is under grassland. 82% uh, 80, in total is in what we call managed grassland, uh, pasture, hay or grass silage, and a further 10% will classify as rough grazing, which tends to be unfertilized grassland. There's further 8% in, in kind of arable type production, um, you know, your cereals, your root crops, your potatoes, your legumes, peas and beans, and about one half percent in fruit and veg. And, you know, we are very much an exported, export oriented nation, depending on the, the, the product and sector, between 85 and 90 percent generally tends to, be, tends to be exported. So I just want to take a, 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 a minute to talk about land use and land use potential. I know some of the previous webinars have kind of covered this in, in, in detail. But um, I just want to, you know, the table is taken from the 1980 soil survey from Redford and Gardner, and the, the figure that's highlighted in red essentially is the, this is across the Republic of Ireland, 23% of the land just over it is what's classified as wide land use potential uh, based on the soils and drainage class. So essentially there's no limitation of what can be grown on, on that land. The majority of that tends to be uh, in the Leinster and, and Munster area, south of that line on the on the, the, the map on the, the left hand side. So you can you can see on the legend the arable is brown, and most of the brown and 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 uh, brown is, is is south of that line. 
And I guess a lot of the uh, pit dairy farms will also be 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 down that 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 uh, that land mass. So if there's twenty three percent with with uh, no limitation, the other seventy seven percent has some limitation, and some is very limited in what we can do with it. So we're not going to be able to grow, uh, you know, your 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 any, any sort of uh, arable or, or any of that on on some of these these land uses, these soil types and land and drainage class type soils. So um, the area that tends to be have most restricted, limited land use tends to be along the western seaboard. Your, uh, your, you know, your Mayo's, your Connemara's, your West Kerry's, your, your, your West Mayo, you know, your West Donegal, and so on. Uh, a little bit, you know, on the other side, you have the Wicklow Mountains. But generally speaking, that's that's how you know. I suppose the point I'm trying to try to make here is that we can't grow crops. We can't grow uh, all crops in all places, and some places have limitation of what they what they can actually grow. Okay, um, in terms of farm structures, uh, in the last uh, farm, farm structural survey in, in 2006, there was just um, above 137,500 uh, farms registered in Ireland. The vast, vast majority of them in the red uh, fall into the uh, livestock rearing category, you no know, rearing cattle or sheep, 76%. About 14% uh, are either are, are milk production, either specialist or are uh, are are dairy with another enterprise. About nine percent of farms fall into the arable type category, where they're growing cereals or or, 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 or arable crops. And a further one percent uh, are in other categories, you know, your your pigs, your poultry, your horticulture, and so on. So the vast majority are in the the the, the livestock rearing uh, class or, or category. Okay, so since about, since since about 2013, uh, we in Chagas have been looking at publishing sustainability uh, data on farms. We published five sustainability reports, and the link to the five reports is in the blue at the bottom. And generally, we reported uh, on these farms across four dimensions: the economic sustainability, environmental sustainability, social, and innovation. And we've done so across the, the four main farm types: dairy farms, cattle farms, sheep farms, and tillage farms. As these are the, the this is what the, the vast majority of the land uh, is, is used for. And we've used the Chagas National Farm Survey to do that, which is part of the EU Farm Accountancy Data Network. So this is economic data we have to report to the to, uh, to, to EU Commission every year by law, by statute. So in today's presentation, I really want to focus on the economic and environmental dimensions because this kind of directly tracks back to what we use our land for. And the, the goods and services that it can provide in these two um, in these two dimensions. Okay, so just presenting some some results on the, from, from 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 the latest report. Again, the, the link to the website at the bottom. Uh, if you look at you know gross margin per hectare, income per labour unit, and viability, and the colours stay the same. Dairy is in blue, cattle in red, sheep in purple, and tillage in green. So uh, on a per hectare basis, we can see that the dairy dairy farms return significantly higher economic return gross margin per hectare compared to the other farm systems and this holds true for the I suppose the other uh, economic dimensions in terms of income per labor unit and viability the gap between tillage and dairy isn't as large on the on the, the second two, second third dimension the income per labor unit and viability because there's less labor required in, in tillage farms but uh, you can see that the, the cattle and sheep farms lag behind significantly the other the other two and especially gearing, and you know, if you look at the last the last uh, graph viability, on um, between 20 and 25 percent of dairy of cattle and sheep farms will be deemed economically viable uh, in terms of their 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 activities from agriculture. If you look at the the environmental dimension, then, and I picked out you know there's, there's a lot there in the report, but I picked out three um, uh, greenhouse gases, agricultural based greenhouse gases per hectare, ammonia per hectare, and nitrogen surplus. The, the story kind of flips in that the Okay, dairy has the highest level of economic um, output, but also the highest level of environmental emissions across these three dimensions, significantly higher than the other three uh, farm systems. So essentially, there's a trade-off here between the economic and the environmental dimensions of sustainability. Okay, so I want to, I suppose, move, move on now to kind of what are the goods and services that, that a cultural land can provide. So. This is a framework developed by some of my colleagues in, in Chagas Johnstone Castle. Essentially, it's a functional land use framework where uh, the, the, the land essentially can provide a number of different services like food, fuel and fibre in white, the nutrient cycling in purple, the habitats in green, carbon sequestration in black and water purification in white. And the idea is that some land types, 
like, for example, tillage, a, bio, a biomass, uh, improved grassland and coniferous forests uh, are, are better at providing better, some services than others. So you can see there, there's a lot of white in those, uh, in those um, graphics. So these land, these soil types and land uses tend to be better at providing, uh, uh, say, the, the, food, the food, fuel and fibre element of, of, of the goods and services. Whereas others, for example, like uh, or rough grazing or, or, or native forestry or peatland or mature have that green there. So they tend to be uh, better, say, providing more habitat provision than, than, than other land uses. And other, others, for example, like the forestry, the peatland and, and grassland to an extent are, are a lot of black in, in, in the graphics. So they tend to be quite good at carbon sequestration. So you're getting the point is that all different land types are better at providing different goods and services. So what are the, the goods and services that we, we're looking from to, to, you know, to provide from agriculture? And you know, we can break these down basically into market-based goods and non-market-based goods. So the market-based goods we're looking for are your food, fuel and fiber, but also your, your rural viability in terms of there's a lot of, you know, outside of 137 odd thousand farmers, we have a lot of uh, upstream and downstream employment provided by agriculture. You know, your inputs in terms of feed and fertilizers and your downstream in terms of your your processing, marketing, and sales, and so on. So, uh, you know, and, and all of that activity is happening in rural areas where alternative employment sources may be, may be scarce. So there are, these are the market-based goods that, that agriculture can provide. We're also a suite of non-market-based goods, and these are very difficult to quantify. So these kind of, the two categories are the two kind of headings. We, we, we generally talk about these things are, are environmental quality, you know, purifying water, sequestering carbon, and providing, providing biodiversity but also cultural heritage and quality of life in terms of, you know, recreational access, providing nice landscapes, aesthetic landscapes, uh, tourism, heritage, cultural heritage, related agriculture. All of this, you know, tends to be uh, uh, provided by agriculture, but it's very difficult to quantify uh, the value of that. So, okay, those market and non-market goods, okay, the framework we can use to describe these is quite a private and public goods. So your private, your private or market goods, what defines this is that it has a defined market and you know, it, prices and quantities are established and you have your Adam Smith invisible hand market finds at equilibrium. So there's some of the goods we're talking about here on the right, right hand side where there's definitive markets and we know uh, what, what consumers are willing to pay or not, they're not willing to pay for these goods. Whereas for public goods, it, it, they're, they're called, they're non-market goods. Essentially the market is absent, there's no market there. So there's no market signals, there's no prices or quantities. We, we can't, we can't, you know, we can't, uh, directly discern what the, what the consumer society wants, want, wants quantities, want, wants from these, these, these goods. So essentially these public goods can be over undersupplied because of the market absence. So it's very, it's uh, trying to measure these can be extremely difficult and we require an alternative method and te techniques like um, non-market valuation. And typically you're, you're relying on survey methods, contingent valuation or choice experiments where you're we are trying to establish if consumers are, are, are willing to pay for a good, and if they are, how much are they willing to pay, how, what quantity do they want provided? So, okay, provided, okay, if we do all those surveys and we've done a lot of those, and there's a lot of, this, this, you know, there's, there's a lot of data out there that suggests that um, consumers and citizens want more public goods from agriculture than maybe to meet, it might be provided. So how do we incentivize land managers to provide a desirable level of good like what's the what's the what's the hook essentially so we have a number of uh, of i suppose of of we have a number of uh, tools in our toolbox first one is regulation and this tends to be used in terms of um, you know constricting uh, environmental bads like you know pollution and so on so we have a suite of eu directives like nitrates water framework habitats and, and legislation the climate action area trying to restrict let's say the the, the bad side of, of public good provision of public bad we also have, you know, a um, market-based mechanism for it, maybe try to encourage the division of, of public goods, like, um, let's say, the economic incentives, like tar targeted agri-environment schemes, where we're, we're subsidizing farmers or giving us, telling them what we want, we want X, Y, Z produced, we're willing to pay you to, to do it. And we also can create a market, and the, the Burn Light Project is a classic example of this, where they're, they've created a market for biodiversity, where farmers are, are scored and they're remunerated based on the biodiversity score they get. So farmers have, have realized that they're farming for flowers now as opposed to, to anything else. And the other, the other kind of, I suppose, a tool in our toolbox would be the education or extension approach, where we try and, and you know, educate, maybe 
educate uh, farmers and general public about the benefits of, of, of these public goods and you know, I suppose they incorporate them into the social norms. Uh, these, these are something we should be, we should, we should be um, encouraging and so on. Okay, so um, what you know, the final couple of slides is that we did a, you know, we have a, we have um we have a mechanism I suppose to send a signal to farmers that we would like some more or less of public good provision, public bad and so on, and the, the common agriculture policy is that 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 mechanism and it's currently under reform, so there's an opportunity there to to send to send the signal to farmers for the next seven to ten years and so on, however long the next cap uh, is framed for. So we did a survey of farmers through the Chagas National Farm Survey in 2018, where we posed a question, you know, there, there are certain options that could be prioritized um, under the next form of the common agricultural policy. So we said like we could go back to the future in terms of recoupling of payments, where they link them back to, to head of cattle or to area of crops, or would you like them to be kind of flattened to sort of the payments are, are the same across all, all farm types. Uh, the second one that was mooted in terms of the, um, the process with generation re renewal, and this is kind of this was flagged by by the commission. So we asked farmers that you know is this something we should be, we should be promoting to our to the cap. And the final three options we provided them with were um, in the public good provision area. So uh, you know uh, incentives to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, improve water quality, or promote biodiversity. And then you know we asked them on a scale of one to five, where one was strongly disagree. Five would strongly agree, asked to rank to, to score those, those different options. So uh, about eight, 750 odd farmers responded, and this essentially is a ranking of the of the priorities uh, on average across those 750 odd farms. On the left hand side, the level of agreement. So one again is strongly disagree, and five is strongly agree, and you have the various options at the bottom. So the generation renewal came out uh, ubiquitously is the strongest across all farm types uh, and farmers have a strong preference that the next generation of farmers be encouraged into the, into the sector. Uh, conversely, the recoupling of payments, they don't want to go back to, to, to the way it was essentially based on this, this, this survey and, and, and flattening of the payments is not the main priority for, for the, the vast majority, for the average farmer would say in the survey. I suppose where, where I'd concentrate on is the, is the middle three, is the water quality, biodiversity, and greenhouse gases. After generation renewal, these three come up the strongest, which is, which is a sign the farmers uh, are, are realize the importance of providing these, these environmental public goods. Water quality came out the strongest, and I can hypothesize that this is because the water quality outcomes can be realized locally. And the same is, is true of biodiversity to an extent. Uh, and people might be surprised the greenhouse gases came out, let's say, third in the, in the list of three. But if you think about it, the biodiversity and the water quality outcomes can be, can be realized more locally, whereas the greenhouse gases is more of um, global, a global uh, benefit as opposed to a local benefit. So in summary, um, there's a lot of demands on land to provide different services. And uh, we've seen different land types and uses are better at providing different services. Um, public goods and agriculture it can be difficult to measure uh, and it can be difficult in, to match the incentives to ensure that the, these public goods are provided at an optimal level in terms of what's, what we want, what society wants and what farmers are paid and so on. Um, farmers to our survey have indicated that they're willing, uh, they, know that they realize, realize the importance of public goods and they're open to provision. I suppose uh, the final point is that, it's, that this is the policy challenge is to is to match the policy with what you know try try incentivize uh, an, opt an optimal level of uh, of this public goods to provide from agriculture. We have the opportunity, perhaps, through the next uh, reform of the common agriculture policy. So um, I've covered a lot there in a short period of time, uh, and thank you for your attention. Anyone who uh, I think we're, we're taking questions at the end. So anyone who has any questions uh, or anything that presents, you can also email me at that my email address there and I will respond in, in, in due course. So on that basis, Kevin, I'll, I'll conclude and hand it back to you. Thank you very much, Cahill. Um, and as, as Cahill stressed there, please use the Q&A function uh, if you have any questions about its presentation or about his research uh, program as described in general. And, you know, everybody can, can get us in Chagas, get first name dot last name at chagas.ie. The next presenter it, this morning is, is my colleague, Michelle McCormick. Michelle was a postdoc in the Agriculture, Economics and Farm Surveys Department, and prior to that, a PhD student in the department. 
but is now a, a economist working in the agricultural catchments program, which is part of the crops, environment and land use program. But, you know, we're trying as much as possible to integrate her into the economics family in Chagask uh, as she sort of, as she forges her career as an economist in that kind of interdisciplinary uh, program that's looking at how agricultural land use uh, affects water and other environmental indicators. And Michelle, I'm going to let you take over now and start your presentation and introduce everybody to your research program. So can, I, can you see my um, presentation? Not yet, Michelle. Here we go. Now, there we go. Yeah, just put on screen view. Okay, from the beginning. So good morning, everybody. And um, following on from Connell there with the public goods, I'm going to look a little bit more detail on, on farm management practices and, uh, and the provision of agri-environmental public goods. And uh, so just, just to refresh the, the public goods um, that we want to look at are through what I'll call is an agri-environmental channel. And so, um, farmland biodiversity, uh, water quality, soil quality, all of these things. Farmers have been providing these uh, public goods, these agri-environmental public goods for many generations. And, and uh, within the um, agricultural catchments program, I suppose it was set up in the beginning to look at the effects of agriculture on, on nitrates to the nitrate directive. And so our, our main focus for many years was on the water quality and availability. But we have um, expanded and so we have um, a soil scientist, a, a hydrochemist, and we've been adding a gaseous emissions element to the, to the program going forward. And so we have all of these things that we're, that we're looking at um, already. Um, and farmers, while we talk about the, the water quality and the soil quality, the public good that is provided through um, improving water quality uh, are things like um, public health and um, well-being. Um, and I suppose, for, for those who are, and public goods really, it's, it's a very difficult concept. So I suppose that the, the one that, that, that jumps out is landscapes because landscapes uh, have been, they're man-made landscapes. So farmers have made these landscapes far to benefit their farming practices. But as a result of those landscapes, we have all the benefits. So we feel good and we like to look at them and we have all those, those public good benefits that as arise as an externality from the farming practices. So. This morning, what I want to look at is a farmer willingness to adopt different mitigation me measures for water quality improvements. And so what we want to look at is how are, how are different farmer objectives, um, how important are these objectives in farmers taking up different mitigation measures? And back again, how do we measure farmer objectives? So Carl has already talked about how, how, um, how difficult it is to measure some of the things that, that we're interested in measuring. And especially on the environmental side, a lot of, a lot of what we want to measure, um, we don't have markets, so we have to um, have different techniques. And so what mitigation measures um, were farmers most in favor of adopting over a range of different mitigation measures that we asked them about? And what mitigation measures were farmers least in favor of adopting? And then at the end, I just want to look at some um, future socioeconomic research that we plan to carry out um, within the, the agricultural catchments program. So first of all, how do we measure farmer objectives? Um, and um, as Carl said, we, when we don't have markets and when we don't have prices and quantities for a lot of these very um, um, subjects that are hard to me measure, we use a survey. Um, and so we've asked in our survey, we've asked farmers um, to measure a number of statements in terms of how important the, the, these different statements are to their farming objectives. And so an example of, um, I'm not naming them all here, but so an example of saying, how, how important is maximizing production to your farming objectives? And how important is it to avoid risky options? And how, how important is the uh, um, prevailing pr preventing pollution from agricultural production. So we asked for farmers um, oh, 23 different statements and asked them to, to rate them from one to five and how important and how, how, how unimportant these were um, to their overall farming objectives. 
And then we use uh, mathematical techniques to group all of those statements um, and responses into, to reduce them into, into um, smaller groups, if you like. And what happened when we did this, and we use a, a technique called factor analysis. So we, we ended up with two very distinct groups and, and we name them environmental farmers who have an environmental objective and farmers who have an economic objective. And when we look at those, um, all of, um, down along on the right hand side, you can see all of the statements that group together. And that's not, I don't want you to focus on all of that, but when we put them into a word cloud, you can see that the, 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 the terms that jump out are that the farm is important, that maximizing um, uh, resources is important, that production is important. And when we look at the sociodemographics behind all these statements, we see that this group of farmers um, they tend to be younger farmers. Um, they're enthusiastic. They have they have big farms. Um, they're willing to take a risk. Um, making money is, is important to them. But the, but the farm is is also important for them. And they're they're interested in taking on future challenges and um, reinvesting in the farm. So they're they're at a they're at a life stage, I suppose, that we can all remember that we were all very enthusiastic and young, and you're you're willing to take a risk. So. The, the group of farmers that have an, uh, an economic objective ha have all those characteristics. The second group of farmers that, um, that, that found all of these statements more important to them, um, they're a little bit older, but you can see that the farm is still um, um, one of the most important things to them. And so their, 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 their objectives are, are, they're still interested in production and they're still interested in making money and far, and on the farm, but they're they're avoiding um, things like um, cross compliance violations and they're preventing pollution and, and family is important and inheritance and succession is important to them and passing on the farm in a good condition is important to, uh, to these farmers with an environmental objective. But across both of these objectives, they, there's an overlap in, in some in some in some regards as well. So what mitigation measures did we look at? Well, we looked at eight different mitigation measures and four of them we will call nutrient, measure, nutri nutrient application measures. And these are kind of the when, where, how, and how much um, uh, of fertilizer that is applied. And um, I have a picture here of the Chagas Green Book. So all of the details and all of, uh, uh, on how all of this works is, is, is available in, in that little book. But we asked farmers um, not applying fertilizer to areas of high risk. And so all of these things, these are very much the, the, the four hours of nutrient management, if you like, um, the right place and the right time at the right amount. Um, and, and they cover the nutrient management. And, and these, these are, are, they cover practices that are already being carried out on the farm, but they're just a different management of those practices. And the second, group of um, uh, mitigation measures, we call them land management measures. So these in, involved, um, they're kind of a once off measure of, of, of doing something. They're not done all the time on a, a basis, but they're, they're probably in, involved more of a cost. Um, so we have fencing off waterways or um, establishing a wetlands, reciting gateways and re repairing, um, establishing a repairing buffer strips. So these are more of a land management um, measure. So the results. So what we found was that um, the mitigation measures that farmers with an economic objective are most likely to adopt. And I've ranked these in terms of the, the coefficients in the, in the regression. So um, reciting gateways away from high risk was their number one. Their number two was fencing off water courses from livestock and then the use of um, this kind of slurry application machinery. And they, were, they also had, so you can see here that farmers with an economic objective um, we're more likely to adopt all of the management um, um, mitigation measures and two of the of the land management measures. And I've rated them here, um, so you can see that the, they're they're number one, two, and three. Um, uh, but they had all of the all of the management ones were important to them, and they were likely to adopt all of them. Um, so the farmers that had an, an environmental objective were most likely to adopt. Number one was establishing um, and maintaining a wetland. Number two was the, the slurry application and then the fencing off the water courses. Um, and the only other one of the mitigation measures that they had that was nutrient management was avoiding risky places. So um, when, we, when we rate those in terms of, you can see the, the establishing the wetlands was top, but their number two and their number three 
are, are the application and the, um, and the fencing off of the water courses. So when we look at um, results, the mitigation measures that, both, that farmers from with both different, and these are very distinct backgrounds, very distinct characteristics, very distinct farmer objective types. Both of them um, were highly motivated to, to adopt um, the use of band or injection split spreading machinery. And both of them were in favor of fencing off water courses. Um, and the mitigation measure um, that neither of these farming, farmer types neither of them were motivated to adopt um, riparian buffer strips. Um, it, it, it wasn't statistic at all across any of the, of any of the, um, the research. So our conclusions, they, they show that, our, that the farmers do have a clear preference um, between farmers that are motivated by economic concerns and farmers that are motivated by environmental concerns, and that the two mitigation measures that they were most in favor of were the use of the band, band or injection spreading machinery and fencing off water courses. And when we look at this, we can say that um, the use of the band, uh, this is probably very, it's an important one. And, and, and we, were, we were delighted to see this because um, uh, other colleagues across Chagas um, with the marginal abatement cost curve have identified uh, all of the um, nutrient management um, uh, measures that to be important, but of all of them, that this is the most important one. Um, and the fencing of water courses. So we, what we say for policy, that there is probably easy wins here in terms of providing support or encouraging farmers to adopt these type of mitigation measures. But our, but our survey also showed that there was no willingness to adopt repairing and buffer strips. Um, and what we can say from that is that if repairing and buffer strips, if they are seen to be important in terms of reduced nutrient losses to water, and if there is scientific evidence then how do we change farmer, <coughs> excuse me, how do we change farmer behavior and how do we encourage farmers to, um, to adopt this measure? So as, I suppose, following on from that, that there is a role for research, uh, we need to develop a deeper understanding of the drivers of, of adoption and, and why are farmers adverse to certain um, mitigation measures that, that scientific evidence may say it is important. And so from that, we need to identify what is the problem? What is the roadblock? What is it that, that is stopping farmers from taking up these different um, mitigation measures and, and possibly having um, very positive outlooks for uh, provision of the public good that we're looking to provide? And so do we need um, policy incentives or do we need more KT? Um, or is it about education? So all of these are, are questions for research and, and questions that we're hoping to answer over the next couple of years. And so um, and there, because there are measures that farmers are more likely to adopt, we need more, maybe we need a more tailored approach to offer farmers a menu of mitigation options. And maybe we need to be matching these to specific requirements. So for, from all of the research, we would say, and, and I, I suppose this, this is coming out from when we look at provision of, of public goods through agri-environmental uh, schemes, we need tailored mitigation measures, we would say, and, and we need um, results uh, based support for, for, for farmers for providing these different, for the, the, the goods through these, by using these different mitigation measures. And so just before I finish up, um, I just want you to make you aware of the, the future research that we're hoping to carry out within the agricultural catchments program. And we have um, um, new um, scientists on board now, and we're all very excited with all the, the new uh, research that can, that can happen. Um, and so we have two new data recorders that are going to collect um, more microeconomic data um, from, from a sample of the ACP farms. And uh, as usual, we are, we are grateful to all the farmers who participate in the program, their ongoing support, and um, we couldn't just do it without them. So um, this, this, if we, when we have this additional data, it'll place the ACP in a very unique position so we can create an integrated farm level biophysical and socioeconomic data set um, it'll allow us to investigate socioeconomic drivers of farm level environmental, economic innovation and social sustainability, and it'll provide information to develop and improve Ireland, uh, Ireland's agri-environmental policy and farm level performance, and it will allow um, the calculation of farm level sustainability and indicators for ACP farms, equivalent to those that are already published in the Chagas Annual uh, Sustainability Report. So on that note, um, I'll 
finish up and if anyone wants further details on the factor analysis or the regression analysis that we carried out for the research, um, you can contact me anytime. Thank you very much. Thanks a million, Michelle, uh, and uh, everybody's doing a great job in encouraging people to get in contact. And there are lots of questions coming in in the Q&A, and I'd encourage everybody watching out there to, to continue to uh, think about the issues being raised by my colleagues and to come in with their questions. Next up is, uh, is my colleague, uh, Mary Ryan. Mary is an economist as well, who's located within the Agriculture Economics and Farm Surveys Department. And Mary's unique in terms of, of her background within the within our program in terms of, of being a, having spent some of her career as a as a forestry advisor and specialist. And that will be reflected, I, I guess, in, in her presentation, which is going to be looking at land use in forestry as a sort of a case study for how land use change might uh, deliver economic and environmental um, dividends to farmers. And with that, Mary, I'll pass over to you. OK, thank you, Kevin, and good morning to everybody. Um, to start with a bit of context, um, you can see on the right hand side that various and multiple state planting programs have led to a big increase in forest cover in Ireland. In actual fact, this land use change from agriculture to forestry largely is the biggest land use change since the foundation of the state, going from 1.5% forest cover in 1920 up to 11% at the moment. Um, we do have some challenges to address though. You'll see on the right hand side of the graph how planty in recent years has fallen off. And this has implications for our um, planting target to reach 18% by 2046. It has implications both for timber production and the processing sector, and also for the delivery of our environmental objectives, particularly around carbon sequestration. Additionally, you will see in the middle of the graph that in the 1990s, there was a big spike in the level of private planting and largely farmer, um, for, farmer foresters. And this has led to um, a position where many of these owners are now at or near the point of harvesting. But because of the low uh, historic forest cover, uh, as a nation, we have little tradition or expertise in forest management. So I'm going to present to you today um, um, some highlights from my research program over the last eight to 10 years, which was undertaken with a team of PhD supervisors, postdocs, PhD students and colleagues uh, within and outside of Chavisk, focusing today on how and where the benefits of forests can be realized. And it's going to be very high level, but the details of the projects, the references and the team are presented at the end of the presentation. Environmental drivers are hugely important in terms of the land use change from agriculture to forestry. The environment impacts on agricultural and forest productivity on the input side, but then on the output side, agriculture and forestry also impact on the environment. As an example of this, if we look at soil type and for agriculture and site type for forestry, we see on the left hand side, if you look at the green columns, on the best soils, there's higher livestock density on farms, and this allows for greater productivity. On the right hand side, you'll see that the highest yield classes or timber production um, are on the better site types. So you have higher timber yield on, on better forest site types. Of the economic drivers, um, it's really about the opportunity cost of planting and weighing up the profitability of agriculture versus forestry. On the farm side, we need to look at farm characteristics like farm system and side, size. On the forestry side, we need to weigh up the uh, species and sites and the yield class. But there are also on both sides, we need to look at market income, subsidies, costs and tax treatment. The big difference between agriculture and forestry is the annual income from agriculture and the long forest rotations and the, the time span of, of the forestry return. Because of this, and in order to compare apples with apples, we need to take a life cycle approach. So we look at the returns over the entire life cycle of a forest. Looking at the relative profitability, uh, we know intuitively that agriculture is more profitable than forestry on the majority of farms, 
But we know from the research at individual farm level that this applies on 66% of farms. We also can see then that forestry is more profitable on 57% of cattle rearing farms, approximately half of cattle finishing and sheep farms, and on very few dairy farms. Again, intuitively, we would know this, but the, the individual distributional analysis shows us this conclusively. Behavioural drivers are really important because it's not just about the money. Um, positive drivers include the environmental gains associated with forestry. It's a good use for marginal land. It involves lower working hours. But on the negative side, culture and attitude are really important. We know that 84% of farmers don't intend to plant, that farmers prefer farming. They prefer money now rather than later. And that the permanent change of land use and the loss of flexibility, as well as the saturation of forestry in some areas are barriers for farmers to planting. Looking specifically at what happens on farms after planting, on the right hand side, we can see that people do actually change what's happening on the farm after planting. 43% of farms decrease stocking rate by more than 5% in the year of planting, 25% uh, increase, and 32% stay the same. So what are the characteristics of these farmers? Do they have different objectives? We find that they do. The cohort who don't change their stocking rate, they have the largest farms and the most intensive farms and possibly have excess land. So they're actually optimizing their land use. For those farms who decrease stocking rate, they already had a high stocking rate before planting but they're much, by far and away the oldest cohort of farms. And what we see them doing is optimizing their income and possibly in preparation for retirement. Whereas those farmers who increase the stocking rate, they're the youngest cohort. They have a large component of off-farm income. So what they are doing is optimizing their time on the farm to allow flexibility for their off-farm work. And what that shows us is that the afforestation decision is not made in isolation. It's part of other wider farming choices. Location is also important. If we look on the right hand side in the green columns at where there are environmental constraints, and these are, we'd say, areas where forestry is precluded or not approved. So we see that there's a very high share of environmental constraints in Wicklow and also a high share in Cork. If we look at counties where the income from forestry is higher, it, that happens in the blue columns in terms of Roscommon and Leitrim. And looking at in the red columns, Cork is the county that has the greatest share of farms where income is higher from agriculture. And what that shows us, again, a lot of it is intuitive, but it, it shows us scientifically that both environmental constraints and relative returns differ across the country, showing the importance of location. In terms of the environmental impact of forests, carbon sequestration is one of the most important. Of the, main, uh, of the carbon pools, the main ones are live wood, and that's live wood above ground, which is the tree that we see, below ground, which is the root system that we don't see, and um, harvested wood products, where when we harvest the trees, where do the products end up? Some of them end up in very long life harvested wood products, such as structural beans and furniture, others in short life. So they don't hold or sequester the carbon for as long. Soil carbon is the biggest soil pool, but it's difficult to measure and it changes slowly over time generally. Um, what we want to look at here, if you look at the life cycle of a, a typical Sitka spruce forest, and um, over the years, over the rotation, over each individual rotation, you're looking at four rotations here and the carbon is incrementally increasing over the life of the forest or the rotation of the forest. When it comes to the point of harvest, because this is a no thin forest, just for, for the purpose of simplicity, uh, there's a big removal of carbon from the forest at the point of harvest. This ends up in, in three different destinations as such. Um, there are harvest losses or losses of carbon uh, to the forest, 
And these can be, we'll say, either um, dead trees or a lot of the branch wood that isn't collected. And these decompose and oxidize to the atmosphere over time. There's also um, uh, wood for energy, which is oxidized over time. Um, and the accumulation of carbon largely occurs in harvested wood products, which you can see in each successive rotation, there's an accumulation of harvested wood products over time. We looked at just a thin forest here, just for simplicity, but uh, there are greater losses and you incur more losses when you thin forests, even though it, it promotes more growth within the forest from a carbon perspective, uh, you, you end up with more losses. And um, what it means is that in this context, growing timber for, uh, growing forests for timber and growing forests for carbon, um, they're not necessarily complementary objectives and they may require different management regimes. <clears throat> in terms of the carbon impact or the carbon value and applying a carbon value to the returns that we looked at earlier. And again, in all of these returns, we're focusing on Sitka spruce. Up until now, we looked just at the private return, the return from the market and subsidy only um, without placing any value on carbon. Um, and that's the, the dark green column. The, the other, the lighter green and the orange columns are where we apply the government carbon values. And uh, the carbon value for 2020 is 32 euro per tonne of carbon dioxide equivalent. And the carbon value for 2030 is 100 euro per tonne of carbon dioxide equivalent. And what you can see, <coughs> excuse me, when you apply these um, and accounting for carbon value would greatly increase the share of farms with higher forest income. There are lots of other ecosystem services uh, provided by forests. And to just go through quickly some of the work that we've, we've looked at, um, uh, in forests generally, in terms of water quality, it's when disturbances happen that you get, um, that you can have a negative impact on water quality. And these are largely at the stage of, of planting uh, thinning and harvesting, um, that you have a negative impact, uh, but these can be largely counteracted by forest management practices around harvesting, which have improved in recent years. Increasing forest cover, on the other hand, and particularly where um, forestry is replacing agriculture, um, over time results in a neutral or small positive impact due to the fact that over maybe a 40 year rotation, you've much less disturbance episodes and you've lower nutrient loads than you might have in agriculture where you have animals depositing nitrogen and phosphate on land on an annual basis. Looking at the biodiversity value, there's a high citizen willingness to pay for mixed forests. In terms of recreation and landscape, there's a growing demand for forest recreation and landscape tourism. And that's something that we're working on at the moment in terms of modeling the potential forest recreation resources around the country. And there's, we also note a high preference for broadleaf over conifer forest in landscape surveys. In terms of rural development, it's a very good news story in that wood products is the highest economic multiplier of the industrial sectors. And that's largely because the, the inputs are largely domestic. There are other planting incentives, such as benefits and taxation that we've looked at also. Um, farm assist improves farm income for, for lower income farms, but the eligibility constraints can limit um, the incentives for some farms, particularly for couples. In terms of the tax treatment, um, there are strong incentives, but it's not relevant for that many farms in that the incentives come at the, the point of sale of, of, of timber. In terms of knowledge transfer or extension, um, uh, something that's very close to my own heart, having lived for a long time within that sphere. Um, work that we have done showed that extension service providers can have a positive impact on forest management outcomes and timber production goals. And this is the case particularly for outdoor demonstrations as, as portrayed in the pictures. And we've also done some work recently with colleagues in the forestry development department um, looking at developing competency in evaluation of extension activities in order to be able to improve uptake and adoption of measures. Two minutes, Mary. One of the, the final challenge that I referred to was um, 
how the system needs to adapt to multiple smallholders. And uh, to look at this particular problem for wood mobilization in Ireland, we adopted an innovation system approach that means you involve all of the actors and examine all their interactions to come up with collaborative solutions. On the right hand side, you'll see a very busy diagram. You don't need to know what's in it, but what it portrays essentially is the number and type of actors involved and all the networks between the different actors. Um, what's important here is that what an innovation system very often shows us is that changing the behaviour of forest owners requires changes in the behaviour of those who create the incentives or policy and that what's really important is examining the entire system rather than looking at one particular subsector. Just to say Gorv Mahagov Galer, um, this was a team effort with a lot of people acknowledgements to the Chagas National Farm Survey and the Forestry Development Department and to the funders of all the different projects represented in this research project which I've presented here today. And for anyone who really wants to get busy, there, the references for each of the published papers and papers in preparation are presented there on the last slide. So, Gaurav Mila Mahagav Kulair. So thanks, Mary. Thanks a million. Uh, I guess we just need to take your screen down. And can I ask all of the um, the speakers to un uh, to start their videos again, please? Um, so we've lots of questions to get through. And if we don't manage to get to your question, uh, just be reassured that we will uh, respond uh, via the Chagas website. There'll be a document that summarizes the questions asked uh, and the answers to those questions. And for those who are uh, looking to know more about this Research Insights Seminar Series from Chagas, uh, the details of the next two seminars are being finalized as, we, as I speak. Uh, so just keep an eye on the Chagas website to find out more about that. So chagas.ie. So guys, uh, turning to the questions, um, we've got quite a few and I'm not sure we'll get through them all in the next 10 minutes or nine minutes. Carl Walsh, uh, who's a colleague from the Department of Agriculture, uh, thanks Carl for an interesting presentation and asks, I guess, about the, the possibility uh, for big changes in the horticulture sector in terms of the area farmed. You know, you have the data from the Farm Structure Survey, Cahill, and then particularly, can we zone in on the, the land that is suitable in terms of soil type and then where it is spatially in terms of frost and so on? You know, do, do you think it would be possible to um, to get the kind of increases that are foreseen in the program for government, for example? Okay, so there's a lot there. I guess uh, from a spatial analysis perspective, some of my colleagues in the spatial analysis unit, I'm sure, can run can run those uh, those models to overlay the soils, the weather, uh, to kind of identify the area that would be suitable. But it's just not like flicking a switch and saying uh, we can double the amount of horticultural land in terms of a lot more uh, factors of play. Um, in terms of the fa farmer element, you're talking about a huge different skill set from what, what, if, if, it's, if, the, if you're asking the farmer to change change their land use to what they're doing presently. Uh, I understand cap uh, horticulture is quite capital intensive uh, to, get, to, get to, to get it started from scratch. Also, you've got things like supply chains, Brexit, I suppose, is, is a big unknown there in terms of the horticulture sector. So I guess look at the in terms of the the area on the is, is quite small. So you know increasing it is probably from a physical by physical perspective isn't it's probably opportunities there. But from the from the market forces uh, type human capital type thing, it could be difficult to, to get get those kind of um, increases. Yeah, yeah. Um, question from from Captain Rascaret. Uh, he used to uh, used to be working at the IFA, but is still involved in terms of consultancy in the ag policy space. Uh, I'll try to answer this one and, and, and others can chip in. And she uh, Catherine asks uh, about this, welcomes the, the stress that we've placed on the, um, the role of farmers in delivering public goods and the cap in terms of supporting them in terms of these things that are valued. Um, and that, but that it's difficult to do. And she asked, does Chagas have a plan to value public goods as output in the National Farm Survey? And what I would say, Catherine, is that, you know, we will continue to follow the rules that set out in the in the FADN in terms of the regulations in terms of how we value output. Uh, it's particularly difficult because the markets, that's the problem, the markets don't exist so we don't have the prices. This is the key thing. What we're focusing on and have been focusing on for a number of years is actually getting a handle on the physicals and 
for example, the research we're doing on biodiversity indicators within the farm survey is a, an example of, of getting some of those quantities that farmers are, are producing both positively and negatively. And then the next step in the, in the research and in the policy space is how we value those. And that's actually quite difficult to do, but it's something that we're working on. And I guess things like carbon prices will help us to, to value the sequestration and the emissions that agriculture is involved in. And, but then the, the challenge of getting the, the, how much consumers are willing to pay for these public goods like landscape services and biodiversity is at the heart of the willingness to pay literature that, that Cahill cited. So it's, it's an ongoing research area. But thanks a million for the, for the point. It's very, it's very important. Um, Carol Quish asks Michelle whether you have more information on the demographics of the farmers across those two kind of clusters that you identify the environmental and the economic in terms of dairy versus beef, derogation farmers, young farmers, old farmers. Could you spend a, 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 a short amount of time telling us a little bit about that? Yeah, we, we have, um, of course, we do have um, uh, details on the demographics and I didn't have time in this to, to go into all of them. Um, and, and there is an overlap as well. So you can say all of them are this and all of them are that. But um, the farmers that were, had the economic um, um, objectives were a lot more likely to be younger farmers. They were more likely to have a, a, um, a livestock enterprise. Now that can include beef and dairy. Um, and they were... Um, um, they were the they're there in terms of the farm demographics um it, because it's a survey and it's not it wasn't the national farm survey that has loads of, of details we have some details i would say that the the farmers that had the environmental objectives were more likely to be uh tillage farmers than than livestock farmers um and uh yeah, that's that's probably probably it, Kevin. I, guess, I guess that highlights michelle the importance of 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 the of the survey like the NFS in terms of its uh, statistical representativity so we can actually say we can we can start to make harder calls in terms of the 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 representative char the characteristics of the of the sample and and by implication because of its representativity statistically about the population out there that that it represents so but it's a very good very good question Mary Roach asks uh, just following on from that about the repair and buffer strips uh, finding that farmers were were less willing or unwilling to adopt this this measure um, and did you distinguish between buffer margins that were fenced versus unfenced no mary we didn't we didn't um distinguish between um between those two but um i've only presented um eight measures that we that we did calculate across the survey um, and these were the measures that we 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 considered that they were um applicable to all farmers and there were another suite of measures that would be more applicable to livestock farmers. And then there were another suite of measures that were more applicable to tillage farmers. But no, to answer your question, we didn't look at the fence riparian. Um, maybe in a future survey, maybe we can look at that as well. One more of you, for one more for you, Michelle, from Pauline McKeown, who says it's great to see farmers uh, open to wetland as a mitigation measure, the establishment of those. And she asked what funding or support is available to encourage further wetland development on farms as a measure? Um, that I'm not sure. Um, I'm, but, but I know that in the, in the future cap, there are going to be more um, environmental um, regulations. So maybe it can be incorporated in there, but I'm not sure, Pauline. Okay, we will check on that, Pauline, and, and, and come back to you, uh, in, as I said earlier. Um, question from Melanie Smith from Mary. Uh, are there grants for reforestation again after harvesting the first crop of timber? I guess that's the kind of a, that's the kind of the bread and butter of the advisory service type of uh, support. Um, and just, just I'll bundle one and another one with it, uh, Mayor, if you don't mind. <coughs> How valuable is forestry for carbon sequestration compared to grass and other crops? I guess that's more the research focus that you, you've had in your presentation. Yeah, um, the, to deal with the first one first, no, there isn't um, a grant for replanting mm -hmm. a forest because if you're replanting, you've just taken off um, a potentially valuable timber crop um, and there are um, tax concessions in relation to um, the timber sales. So no, there isn't to answer the first one. Secondly, how, value is it, how valuable is forestry compared to grass um, in terms of carbon sequestration? There is no one answer um, because it depends totally on, we'll say, the soils, the forest species, the yield class, the whether it's uh, thin or no thin, and the length of the rotation, 
and the the time the stage during the rotation because carbon sequestration uh, changes annually over time as trees grow faster and slower. So not being smart, there isn't an easy, simple answer. It's really complex in terms of where we're talking about displaced emissions from agriculture by um, planting forestry. Um, you're very much talking about the system then that you're replacing, um, whether it's dairy, beef, sheep, tillage, whether it's intensive or extensive, the number of animals and the level of, of manure deposition and how slurry is managed, things like that. But it is in terms of, of there is a high displacement capacity in terms of, of balancing the carbon sequestration from the forest and, and the emissions from agriculture. And that's, I suppose, where, you know, in terms of meeting long term environmental goals from both agriculture and forestry, that's a big win, big win win for everybody. Thanks, Mary. We're almost, we're almost uh, unfortunately at the end of our, our, our Q&A uh, space. I'm going, to, I'm going to take the liberty of having another minute. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, one more, ask one more of the questions that are put in. But just to reassure uh, everybody listening that all the questions will be addressed uh, by the seminar participants uh, in the next few hours, I guess. Um, the last question I'm going to ask is a general one. Uh, so chip in, you three, if you want to answer it. Um, Carl Walsh, again from the Department of Agriculture, asks, he's a great guy for questions, is there any research which quantifies the power of regulation and enforcement of same versus monetary incentives in terms of applying good mitigation practice? And I guess this goes back to your, some, one of your slides uh, with the stick, the carrot, uh, and the KT education uh, push. Cahill, do you want to try and answer Carl's I'll question? Or I'll, 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 I'll first crack it up, Kevin. Yeah. It, it really depends, Kevin, on, on what you're trying to do. So uh, there is research there, you know, in terms of what do you, what's the public good you're looking, you're after. So, so cert, certain, um, so, you know, certain measures, it's all about targeting, I suppose, which, which instrument will, will target uh, the, the public good in the most cost-effective way to, to derive it. So generally, it can, be, it can be economic instruments or it could be regulation, depending on the public good. And generally speaking, the, target, the more targeting measures tend to be the economic instruments, which tend to be more economically efficient in general terms. Yeah, I think I, I, before I close, I, just, I would say that, that some of Michelle's research on the, the willingness to adopt points to uh, measures that may not need an awful lot of, of encouragement. And, or may, and then there may be measures like riparian buffer strips that for some reason, uh, farmers are less willing to adopt, which may require more, either more incentives or more of a, of a, of a, a kind of concerted push from a knowledge transfer perspective. So I think that socioeconomic research that we're doing, looking at farmers, uh, behavioral drivers is important in terms of understanding what policy strategy that people like Carl should be proposing. Mary, did Could you I want just, to come in? Yeah, finally? Just, just very quickly. Um, one of the behavioural psychologists that I work with in NUIG uh, gives the example of, uh, in terms of looking at incentives rather than penalties. From a behavioural psychology perspective, if I give you an incentive to do something, you're happy about getting that incentive. And you're, you know, if the incentive is big enough, you'll do it. If I give you an incentive and then take back part of it in a penalty, uh, human nature focuses on the, the money that we have lost rather than the money that we have gained. And we see what happened as an overall transaction of penalty rather than incentive. So if I give you 5,000 euro and take 2,000 euro back, you don't say, that's great, I now have 3,000 euro. You say, ah, but what happened? I now, I don't, now don't have 2,000 euro and that's what you focus on. So in terms of penalty and incentives from behavioral psychology, that's, that's kind of where they would focus. The incentives mean more to us than the penalties. Or are or, or we just, or, or, or that we just we focus on the penalties them. too much and, and forget about the, the Exactly, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. Thanks everybody. Thank you to my colleagues, uh, Mary, Cahill and Michelle. Thank you to uh, Anne Kane and Siobhan Dermody in the background who have made this possible. Uh, and as I said, Check the Chagas website for details of upcoming Research Insights seminars, and I hope everybody has a lovely day, and I hope everybody stays safe uh, out there. Thanks a million. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Thank you.